Our assignment for tonight is Hands of Misguided Zeal. I don't know how many of us use the word zeal. You know, a, a, an aggressive, strong desire that finds its way into your actions. Hands of misguided zeal. Somebody has to do something. Somebody just has to do something. When was the last time you said it? I know you've said it. How about when you're driving down Maple Street and you see a pothole about 20 feet ahead and you have no opportunity to veer into the next lane and you hit that pothole and the whole front end of your car shakes and your fillings hurt in your teeth. Somebody's got to do something. Somebody's just got to do something. How about we had this experience, uh, fire, the smoke alarm goes off while you're eating a meal. Somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to act. Somebody's got to do something is the sort of statement we hear from men or women who decide to run for public office, right? And they say the school board needs help or the county needs new direction. Somebody's got to do something. It means that you have come to the conclusion that you can't count on things to change by themselves. Whoever's supposed to be in control isn't doing a good job. Maybe you speak it like the Apostle Peter spoke it in the scripture for tonight when you say, the people around me aren't doing a thing. I have got to take a stand. Here I stand. Somebody's got to do something. Here's the specific words. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove. He and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place. Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers. They were carrying torches, lanterns, weapons. Jesus answered, if you're looking for me, then let these men go. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck. Somebody's got to do something. Peter had been pushed to the edge, and he said, it's up to me now to act, to do the right thing. And he drew steel, and he used it on another human being. Jesus commanded Peter, put your weapon away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Somebody's got to do something. <clears throat> okay, take a breath. Somebody's got to do something. What am I going to do? How am I going to act? We live on this planet, and we are part of two different kingdoms at the same time. One is the church, capital C, all the boys and girls, men and women, who have been convicted by the word that they are sinful from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Their consciences testify to this, even if other people couldn't prove it. And all these boys and girls, men and women know that God has sent someone to be their substitute, their savior. That's the church. It's a kingdom. At the same time, 
we live in another kingdom called the state. Both of these kingdoms are designed by God. Both of these kingdoms are gifts of God. Both of these kingdoms are good and to be treasured and to be prayed for and to be worked for. However, these kingdoms have different assignments. You know the church's assignment? It is to distribute forgiveness to fools and sinners. You know the state's assignment? It is to keep order so that people can live their lives. God has given to each kingdom a tool which will accomplish the assignment he gave them to do. The tool that God has given the church to do its assignment of distributing forgiveness to fools and sinners is the gospel, the good news. And the tool that God has given to the state to do its work of maintaining order is force. The state is not to take the church's tool and use it. It's not their business. And the church is not to take the state's tool, sword or nine millimeter, and wield it in order to accomplish God's goals for the church. So are we done here for tonight? Peter drew his steel, and he, I'd like to ask you why he did it. Why did he do what he did? Fear? What was he afraid of? He took it and he swung, and you know the story. He apparently wanted to hit somebody like you might hit a pumpkin and split his head into two pieces. The guy must have moved his head just slightly so Peter came down on the side of his head. But he drew a weapon to advance the kingdom of God. I think we all see the misguided zeal. It's probably a different question. What would you have done if you had been there? I don't know if I'd have done any different. I don't know if I could have done any different. Would anybody say I have to do everything possible to defend Jesus? Jesus said, put that down. Shall I not drink the cup my Father has given me? Maybe we can get at the reason Peter did what he did if we, I know it's late in the day, I don't know if you're up for this, but if we can think, what should Peter have thought as he stood there in the garden in the olive grove and they were taking Jesus to arrest him, to bind him, to beat him, all Peter's fears. Things are not going the way I had hoped. This is the absolute worst thing that could happen. Okay, take a breath for a minute. We're going to take a run at this a different direction. What does God want to teach you in this book? It's a mighty big book, 1,500 pages. Who is bold enough to say, I know the Bible. I've been in every corner of it. There's no closet in this book I haven't been in. Nothing. There's no secrets in here. I know it all. Who is so bold as to say that? And then if if you have read it through, did it leave you with some questions? 
I wonder if it would be possible to summarize the teachings of the Bible so that the average person could get a grip on them. Well, now you're talking about something called a catechism. Catechism is a book of questions and answers. It doesn't replace the Bible. It's supposed to be a gate into the Bible. You could write your own catechism. There's no right or wrong about how many chapters you would have, but you know the common catechism, the little catechism that we're familiar with. That's divided into six parts. It's a way of saying that you can take the whole Bible and boil it down. Like your grandma used to take a turkey or a chicken carcass and put it in a pot and put a lid on it and boil it down to get the good stuff, the stock. The catechism has six parts, six chief parts. The first is the commandments, and people usually think that the commandments are the main deal, right? The Ten Commandments, if only we could teach all the kids in America the Ten Commandments, and we'd be better off. Because the commandments are what God is like. The commandments tell us what God is like. Honest and healthy, these are the house rules. If you want to live in God's world and you want happiness, you keep them. And don't you dare go head to head with him and chin to chin with him. Not only does unhappiness lie that way, but your worst nightmare. For God to say, go away from me. So the commandments really good as they are. I mean, really, you shall not steal? How is that a bad thing? If that commandment wasn't there, not one of us could walk out in the parking lot after this service and hope that our wheels or our vehicles would be there. Of course it's a good commandment. It's the way God is. The commandments... Somebody once said, you really don't break the commandments. You break yourself on them. Would you understand that? You really don't break them. You break yourself on them. The commandments do, they used to use the word contrition, which is a great word because it means to grind to a powder. Grind to a powder. The commandments make us contrite. They crush us like a little car tangling with a great big tractor trailer out on I-80 in western Nebraska, and you don't know where the, where the truck leaves off and the human body begins because that spinal cord is demolished. It's over. And that's the way that Jesus saw you. That was his first glimpse of you, is crushed and dead. So the second part of the catechism is called the creed. And you know the creed. We say this every, all the time, and there's three parts to it. And the first part is one sentence. There is a God. He can do anything. Everything comes from him. And then you get the part about Jesus. It's 11 verbs. It's kind of like the letter V. It goes down, and then it goes back up again. Conceived, born, suffered, died, buried. And he goes down to hell and plants his flag in the middle of the enemy camp. Descends into hell, the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, sits at his father's right hand, and will return to judge. So my question for you, if you can handle it this late at night, we're trying to figure out what Peter was afraid of. Why did he pull a piece? Aren't those two parts of the creed enough? Couldn't the creed end after the Jesus section? Is there, is there anything we really, we, we really need to believe that's left over? I remember that third part from when I was a boy. I had to memorize it, but I, you know, I always felt like it was sort of a throwaway or the game was over when you get to the end of the Jesus section. But what does it say? It takes you back to Genesis 3 where the Lord God said to Satan, I declare war on you. I put enmity between you and this woman. War. There will not just be an evil spirit in this world. I am sending my Holy Spirit, and there shall be war. He will gather a family, the creed calls it, the church. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, sometimes called the community of saints. I am gathering a family called the church. I will have a family. The Holy Spirit will do this. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. He's got the stuff. He's going to do it. I will have a family. In this church, in this family, there is a treasure. It's called forgiveness. It's available nowhere else. I gave it to the church. Think about that. If you're thinking right now that forgiveness exists elsewhere than among God's people, then what did Jesus mean when he said, I give it to my church? The church has forgiveness and distributes it. We use these three pieces of furniture to remind us of it. You don't need furniture to worship, but they help. The promise of forgiveness distributed here. The promise of forgiveness. This is my body. This is my blood given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And in the spoken word, I forgive you your sins. I don't care how you feel about it. I'm plopping forgiveness on you. This is Christ's word and command. Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. So, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the forgiveness of sins. Those who know the forgiveness of sins aren't so scared of death anymore. Why? The resurrection of the body. Jesus said, I'm going to haul your after the Beatles and the roly-polies are done with you, I'm going to put you back together lovely, healthy, the way I created you to be. The, the, the beautiful body that I had when I came back, they recognized me right away. I said, touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and blood as you see I have. And then he said, you got anything to eat? And they said, we're having grilled fish for supper, broiled fish. And he said, I love broiled fish. And he sat down and ate with them with his resurrection body. It's beautiful. The pieces didn't just fall through because he was a ghost. He's got flesh and blood and he took it to heaven. We're not Hindu. We don't believe that when you die, the birdcage opens and your soul flies out and you leave your body behind. No. Jesus said, I took your flesh and blood with me to heaven. I have it to this day and you shall have yours too. So the resurrection of the dead bodies and the life everlasting. And, you know, we know what life is. We have it. But this is life temporary. True? Not one of us gets out of here alive. We have life temporary. I drive by a high school where there is a stoplight. And at the base of the stoplight, there is a little bundle of yellow plastic flowers and a teddy bear and a little whirly thing, and a candle, what does that mean? That means somebody turned left across traffic, and they stopped running. Temporary life. But the creed ends like this. The forgiveness of sins, boom, it's like fireworks. The resurrection of the dead bodies, boom, and life everlasting, boom. So here's my question. What did Peter think he was going to do? by preventing Jesus from going to the cross? Of all the dumb things he ever did and said in his impulsive, impatient, impetuous character for all the goodness of his heart and wanting to do the right thing, to say, Jesus, you shall not go to the cross. And Jesus had to say what you heard him say last Sunday when he said, get behind me, Satan. This time he says, put that weapon down. You don't advance the kingdom of God with a nine millimeter. You don't advance the kingdom of God by drawing steel and trying to cleave someone's pumpkin in half. Put it down. The scripture says it was the will of the Lord God to crush him and make his life a sin offering. Hands of misguided zeal. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> we'll sing, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into 
your hands 